So as Kevin said, we'll talk about, or I talk about sample efficient reinforcement learning for CERN accelerator control. Uh, so and this is the work of, of uh, 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 several people. Uh, I name them all here um, uh, on, on the first slide here. Uh, over the last maybe uh, two years, I would say. And I'd also like to mention the ML Coffee, which um, essentially enabled um, lots of this work as the meeting place or the forum that was established um, after the last ICFA machine learning workshop, actually. So last year, early last year. So um, why are, did we start looking uh, in, in, into to reinforcement learning? I mean, Kevin mentioned it already a little bit. Um, so our goal for accelerator operation, and, and I think this is the same everywhere, is to have maximum efficiency and maximum flexibility while achieving maximum performance. Now, these um, are and might seem to be um, uh, not achievable at the same time, all these, this, uh, these objectives. And um, so what we've decided for a long time, at least here on the injector side at, at CERN, to um, sacrifice to some extent a little bit of efficiency and flexibility uh, to have maximum performance. Um, if we want to actually do the next step and have them really optimum, all of them, then uh, physics-based and deterministic operation of accelerators is the way to go. Um, where uh, you remove as much as possible trial and error uh, in, in the control. Now, this is not always possible because one needs models uh, and to have these models also uh, available online and these models can be very complicated. Um, now, also, there might be drifts. Uh, also the, Kevin was already mentioning uh, some of uh, these um, effects that we have to deal with as well, like hysteresis. Um, temperature effects, aging, et cetera, et cetera, which makes the modeling even more complicated. Of course, uh, one needs to have sufficient beam instrumentation. It's also not always there. And on top of all of this, of the models and the beam instrumentation, one needs algorithms. And the models might not always be easily invertible. So one way out is to go to, towards automated and sample efficient optimization, being uh, mathematical optimization algorithms. Now, uh, reinforcement learning. So uh, why, why did we look at this? Now, numerical optimization needs some exploration. There are algorithms out there that are very sample efficient. So this exploration phase might be very short, but it needs some exploration phase at each deployment. While reinforcement learning after the training, um, this exploration phase is reduced to a minimum and uh, to one iteration in the best case. And the reason for this is that these algorithms learn the underlying dynamics of the problem, but the need for this an additional input, they need the state information. And then what they do is that they given um, a state, they apply an action to, to achieve maximum reward. So we'll come back to this um, on, on the next slides. And so what you'll end up with um, as, as your final product after the training are controllers like uh, model predictive control. So um, to, to, to um, show you a little bit uh, what we did, I'd like to first introduce a few basic terms of uh, reinforcement learning. So this is by no means um, a full-fledged introduction, um, but just to make it, to make certain aspects um, uh, more uh, easily understandable, as a few key words that need, need to be nevertheless introduced. So I mentioned it already earlier, so the, 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 the way these algorithms work is that they learn how to act given a certain state. And what you try to achieve is to, to maximize uh, the uh, a cumulative reward. Now, I've tried to illustrate this, uh, the terms that are involved here with a very simple example, namely trajectory steering. Um, so the state in, uh, for trajectory steering, so trajectory correction, um, is defined by the reading of beam position monitors. The action, which is denoted as A, um, are the dipole corrector settings. 
And um, this is what is you can get from uh, the environment. Very often we call this environment. So you get the state of the system and the actions are also produced by the system, by this environment. And it also produces a reward. And the reward for our trajectory steering example could be intensity on target, could be uh, the RMS of the trajectory times minus one, um, as the agent will always try to maximize the reward, whereas we wouldn't like to minimize the RMS. It could also be the losses along the line. Um, and this reward is then um, given to the agent as also uh, the state. The state could be given to the, to the agent uh, in the form of observation in case you have um, not a, a state that is not fully observable. And then the agent on the other side, this uh, uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, this controller if you want, but in reinforcement learning they're always called agents. So this agent then, um, as it got the state, it has a policy and uh, this policy has parameters. Uh, they're denoted here as theta. Um, in, in our context here, we are uh, doing deep reinforcement learning. So this policy um, 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 is, for example, stored in the form of a neural net. And this policy now, uh, with this parameter theta, takes the state eight and then decides um, the action to take. And uh, these parameters are uh, adjusted such that it maximizes um, the uh, reward, the cumulative reward. Now for this to work, this RL agent um, expects the environment or the problem to be a mark of decision process. So um, if you are in a, in a state S1 uh, and you have the transition probability P to go to state two by taking uh, action one, um, then this should only, this transition probability really only depend on the current state and the current action and not on any previous states. Okay, so this, this, is, this uh, is how, what, what the, the, the agent expects and um, the learning is done episodic. So you essentially uh, iteratively solve the problem within one episode by going from one um, state to the next and the agent tries to um, uh, maximize the cumulative reward along this uh, state trajectory, okay? Sorry. Um, now, as I said, the goal is to find these parameters theta that uh, maximize the total reward uh, or to, to, to come up with the optimal policy. It's episodic learning, we also said that. So you maximize the reward during that episode along the trajectory. Um, and um, there are uh, various uh, concepts uh, behind finding the optimum policy. So there is, for example, also the so-called Q function and value function. Um, and they are defined uh, for a given policy uh, in this, this uh, way here below. So the Q function, um, as, which is a function of state and action, is the expected total reward from taking uh, action A in state S, given a certain policy. Now the value function, which is related to the Q function, is the expected total reward uh, from state S, also given this policy again. And as I said, the value function is related to the Q function as through the policy we know which action we take. So if you take the action following the policy, um, then uh, this, the, the, uh, the value function essentially is the Q function for this, uh, this, this action. Yeah. So uh, you will see later on when we talk about so-called Q learning, which got, gets its name from the Q function, then the value function is just the maximum uh, of the Q function, so the maximum with respect to the action to A. Okay, now there are various algorithm types out there, and um, the goal, as I said, is always to find these parameters um, of, for example, your neural net, um, that give you in the end uh, um, a policy that uh, uh, maximizes the uh, cumulative reward. Now there is, there are algorithms out there that are called policy gradients and they just do uh, gradient descent essentially on, on, 
on this above um, objective here. Then there are uh, algorithms that are value based where uh, one learns either the value function or the Q function of the optimum policy without having actually any explicit policy. There are actor critic algorithms where you estimate the value function or the Q function of the current policy and use it to improve the policy. So essentially you have two networks. One is a policy network, the other one is for example, a, a Q function network. And then you have model-based RL. So these first algorithms here, they are model-free. And then there's model-based reinforcement learning where you um, learn the transition model uh, uh, for the state transition from um, state and action to the new state or the dynamics uh, uh, of uh, 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 the model of the dynamics that you're dealing with. And then you use this uh, model for planning without any explicit policy or to improve the policy. Now, which algorithm should one choose? Now, which criteria should one take? Um, so one of the criteria, uh, obviously, uh, for us was sample efficiency. So how many interactions uh, does the RL uh, algorithm need until it has learned the optimal policy or Q function? And um, now there is um, a, a, a clear difference uh, just by uh, how these algorithms are done and what's behind them uh, in terms of sample efficiency, what you expect already uh, uh, just from from um, from literature and theory. So um, in general, the on policy um, uh, algorithms, so those uh, that do uh, the, the policy gradients essentially, are less sample efficient. Sorry. My Adobe just kicked in and killed my preview. Let me reshare this. Sorry for this. Okay. Okay. Do you see this again? Yes. Okay. Sorry again. Um, so and um, so, um, of policy algorithms like, for example, the actor critic uh, style algorithms or the Q function uh, or the Q learning algorithms, they are um, more sample efficient, and the most sample efficient ones are the model based algorithms. Now, machine time is expensive, so uh, some of the algorithms are excluded on the machine, like uh, the on policy. Uh, uh, um, uh, algorithms like the gradient um, uh, uh, policy gradient algorithms and you will see an expert um, and a comparison actually later on as well and uh, what we actually started with is not the model based ones even though they're the most sample efficient ones uh, but q learning and actor critic methods um, and the reason for that was that um, those alg algorithms are actually also simpler and then at a later stage, and you will also see some results about those, we moved to model-based uh, reinforcement learning. There are many methods out there, and uh, we only had a look at a few so far. Now, the basic Q-learning algorithm is that um, you generate samples, and we'll have a look in uh, a second what this means to generate samples. And then you fit uh, your value function or your Q function. And um, the the policy, the way to exploit your, your Q function or value function is uh, that the policy you use is that for a given state, you um, uh, take the action that maximizes your Q function, okay? 
And then you use either the agent in this manner to generate more samples, or you go take, for example, a random policy in between to increase um, um, exploration. Now, uh, um, in, a, in a naive approach, you could model the Q function uh, in a neural net in this manner here. Um, input side, your state in action, output your Q function. Um, and here again, uh, this is uh, writing down in, 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 in pseudocode uh, how you train um, this, this kind of neural net. Um, so you'd collect this data set and um, this, is, this is what this looks like. So you always collect the state, the action, the next state and the reward that you got in this next state. Um, then you define the target as the reward that you got plus the discounted value function in the next state. Or it's the same thing as the maximum um, of uh, the Q function in the next state, so the maximum with respect to the action. Um, this, this is namely your, 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 your policy, your optimal policy. And then uh, you simply um, update your weights of this network by doing um, MSE, gradient uh, descent on MSE between the current Q function and your target, okay? Now, I actually go through these details here because um, there is one important aspect, which is this maximization that you have here on the one hand in this update rule for the weights, but you also actually have it, if you remember on the previous slide, for if you want to exploit your neural net to define the action that you should take in a given state. And this, this can become a problem, only it is actually a problem in continuous action space, uh, which is of course the most interesting one uh, for us in the accelerator problems. So this type of uh, Q learning um, was very successful for discrete action space but it has this disadvantage um, in a continuous action space because you can imagine that if the Q function is non-trivial, that maximization is not always um, uh, straightforward. Now the way out for this uh, was um, to use um, normally the actor critic uh, architecture, like the DDBG uh, algorithm for those that have heard about this. Um, this is the, 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 the the most successful really uh, uh, way of, of, of doing it. If, however, you have, uh, you're dealing with a, with a particular problem, for example, uh, your rewards are uh, convex with respect to, to your actions, then you can use a trick. Um, and this is what we started with. Um, we essentially, um, we're starting with such a situation and we uh, could assume for the Q function to belong to a function class that it is easy to optimize. Namely, uh, that it would be depending quadratically on, on the action. And this is the trick that is uh, um, exploited in the algorithm uh, normalized advantage function or NAF algorithm. So where the Q function is uh, assumed to look like this, this part here is called advantage function. That's why you have this name. The architecture of the neural nets looks like this. And then mu is nothing but um, the action that maximizes the Q function. So it comes out directly. And for the update rules, where you, where you need the maximum of the Q with respect to S is nothing but the value, the value function. Um, so, and here it just works all, all by itself and maximization is no problem and we started with this. Now our test tested for the model free RL agents in 2019, this is when we started this, um, was the electron line uh, at awake and then also LINAC4, so the H minus LINAC, LINAC4 uh, during its commissioning run. All the other CERN accelerators, they were in shutdown in 2009, and most of them are actually still in shutdown um, this year. Now, the initial test cases on AWAKE and later on also for LINAC4, uh, this was trajectory correction. Um, because of the fact that it's an ideal test case, it has a well-defined well state S, it's high dimensional in action and state space, um, and you can easily compare it with existing algorithms because this is, of course, a solved problem if you want, and you can also solve it, uh, the problem analytically. 
Now, the, gain, the goal was to train a controller that corrects um, as well as the SVD, the classical SVD trajectory correction algorithm, resulting in a similar RMS uh, of the final trajectory, and ideally do this within one iteration. So when we implemented NAF, we uh, improved it uh, with prioritized experience replay. Um, we tested NAF on, on, on these problems uh, uh, here, and I'll come back to this in a few slides. And we also used then later on the DDPG variant TD3 from the package stable baselines for another problem that I will also describe for awake optics matching. Now, um, CERN has a Python interface to the accelerator control system um, through what is called PyTripC. Um, and this uh, made it uh, fairly easy to, to actually implement all these various algorithms or to reuse what has been uh, implemented elsewhere because most of this uh, is being done in, in Python. And another key component actually for, for um, uh, algorithm development and comparing algorithm was actually that we switched to um, what has been developed by OpenAI. We named it switch to the OpenAI gym environments. So um, these are essentially classes which uh, allow you an interface which contains the, all the problem specific uh, code. Um, I just uh, took a screenshot here of um, from the GitHub repository of the description of this, this environment class, um, which just uh, shows the various methods that, it, that one would have to implement um, as, a, as a user. I just mentioned two, the most important ones are the step method and the reset method. Now step is very much like the objective method in the numerical optimizers if you want. The argument is the action that you would get from the agent. And then you just have to implement what you do with this action and you return the next state, uh, the reward, also whether the episode is finalized. So this is a Boolean finalized uh, because, for example, the problem is solved uh, well enough or because uh, you've run into uh, machine protection uh, constraints, etc. And, there, and you can also uh, return uh, a dictionary with info, which is maybe uh, less important in this context here. And then there is this reset function, which is the method um, that uh, defines the initial state um, at the beginning of an episode, or if, if you want, defines the initial, the, the problem actually that the agent then need, need, needs to solve. And this restur uh, restrains um, the, um, the state. Now, AWAKE, as I said, um, uh, we, we worked on the AWAKE electron line. Now, AWAKE by itself is um, a proton-driven uh, plasma wake field test facility. Um, now, uh, the protons we couldn't have because of the fact that the SPS uh, that delivers the protons at 4 GeV uh, was in shutdown. Um, so there was also no real plasma physics, if you want, or plasma wake field uh, acceleration, uh, because we could only have the electron line. Um, this is schematically shown here as what we were dealing with. Um, so it consists of a 20 MeV RF station and then about uh, 15 meters transport uh, to uh, the plasma cell uh, after this, this RF station. Now it has various beam instrumentation, beam position monitors, also BTVs, um, and, um, and correction elements uh, uh, on the one hand dipole correctors, then, but then also solenoids and quadrupoles, etc. And we have basically two problems, of, or if you want, two gym environments. One is for trajectory steering, um, which is uh, the state 10 BPMs um, and the, act, uh, the actions 10 correctors. And then uh, uh, another environment for auto matching at the uh, plasma entrance, where uh, the observation is um, a, the image uh, on a BTV uh, right at the entrance uh, to the to the plasma cell, and then the actions are two uh, solenoids and three quadrupoles. Now. RL, does it work? So this is a, this is a spoiler, if you want, um, for, for the slides to come. 
Um, but I don't want to hide anything. So yes, it does. Um, so we can train controllers according to the goals that we have uh, defined and, and you see this um, uh, uh, soon. Um, and it's also sample efficient uh, enough. Uh, and, and I will also show you um, uh, more about this. But uh, there is a but. Um, one needs additional observation for the state information. And I think this is, this is, um, this is a hurdle. So there are, there are um, not so many problems maybe in the end where you can actually use reinforcement learning. Eh? So numerical optimization gets away with a lot less input uh, if you want. Um, and but the, the, the real challenge, I believe, then if you have uh, sufficient state uh, information, is the reward shaping. This can be highly non-trivial. Um, and one has to think about many aspects uh, if one wants to have that the training converges uh, at all. So what we did is we introduced reward thresholds, uh, but the thresholds, they have to be uh, not too low, but also not too high, such the agent actually has a chance to, to, um, to, to uh, reach the goal. Um, one has to, to avoid that the agent exploits unreasonable settings combinations. One has to ensure that the agent learns to solve the uh, problem within uh, as few iterations as possible. Uh, what about punishment if it does something that you really don't want it to do? What about sparse rewards, etc.? So this is really an, an uh, uh, open-ended list because um, uh, this, I think, is the biggest challenge with, with um, reinforcement learning if you, if you want to apply it. But if you have a good reward function, then it works. And I'll show you uh, an example here. So this is the model-free online uh, uh, learning of the NAF agent for awake trajectory steering. Um, so this is a proof of principle really because um, the awake line is very well modeled and they, they obviously have the, the classical steering algorithms. Um, and for us it was, was to see whether, whether this, this actually works. And it, it, it really works uh, very nicely. So th this is how we, we usually plot it to see whether, whether, whether these agents were actually doing what, what we wanted to do with them. On the x-axis you have the number of episodes and um, this lower plot here, you have um, actually our goal, the RMS, if you want. So you want to reduce the RMS um, below a certain threshold here. Um, and, and here you can see how many iterations the agent took. So at the very beginning here, this NAF agent uh, used many iterations and, uh, and didn't reach the threshold uh, RMS, it actually deteriorated very much the threshold from the initial setting, which is in green now. Uh, so the final RMS where it ended up in is shown in blue. But then after a while, after let's say 15 episodes or so, it understood the problem, it understood the line, it understood the response if you want, and then it, it managed to actually correct this line each time above the target within one or two iterations. Okay, so this uh, Verena, can I can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Um, could you um, uh, more precisely explain how you set up each episode? So my understanding is initially the steering uh, the steering elements are not well tuned, and then your algorithm takes a few steps and tunes them, and then you manually detune them, or you wait for the machine to drift before starting a, a next a, a new episode, basically. So. So each, at the beginning of each episode, you call the reset method. Um, so, so maybe you remember this. So this was in, in this OpenAI gyms, you have to implement this reset method. And essentially what we do is just we randomly set uh, the diaper correctors. And then you end up with this initial RMS in green here. And then we, we, we essentially tell the agent, if you want, um, please go and correct it. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Now, um, because we, we had our own implementation um, uh, of the SNAF algorithms, we could actually look a little bit behind the scenes and we could actually look also how these networks actually trained and how, what, what they looked like. Um, so you have here in blue this loss. So if you want, this is this what's also called sometimes this temporal difference error. 
uh, you remember this this MSE on this 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 target um, uh, which was called Y earlier and and the Q function that we have okay this behaves like this but what's, what's interesting is how the value function actually uh, behaves so at the beginning uh, it actually is very much overestimated and after about 90 iterations so this corresponds to about this 15 episodes that we saw earlier where where the agent actually started to behave properly um, it, it kind of gets to a reasonable value and then it uh, uh, still takes some while, however, uh, until we stabilize it at around minus 0.05. Now, uh, if you want to interpret this, so this corresponds to um, reaching um, on average an RMS after correction of 0.05 if the correction only takes one iteration. Now, we also compared um, NAF to, to other algorithms. We compared the NAF algorithm, which is Q learning, to, for example, um, a policy gradient algorithm. Um, for this, we took from the stable baselines package again the, the uh, PPO algorithm, which is one of the state of the art uh, policy gradient algorithms. And you can really see, I mean, this difference, uh, as you've seen earlier on this, on this, on this, this, this um, illustration of the sample efficiency for the various algorithms that um, it would just take much, much longer. So here on the x-axis, you have not iterations, but this is actually episodes. And uh, you see uh, how slowly uh, the PPO um, actually um, trains uh, with respect to, to, to the NAF. And um, as I said, we were also using um, TD3. Uh, I'm not talking so much about the algorithm, what's behind the TD3, but uh, just to say, TD3 is a very good algorithm. Um, you can see here, this is essentially the same performance if you want. Um, and the good thing about TD3 um, is that it doesn't have this limited representational power. It doesn't assume, for example, a, a special uh, 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 form of, of the Q function. Uh, so it doesn't have this quadratic dependence on the action of the, of the Q function. So TD3 um, was also one of the algorithms that we used a lot then afterwards. Okay, so another example with the NAF algorithm now. So we used uh, this experience that we gained now with the trajectory and tried to just uh, use it on, on LINAC4. Now this is an illustration of the layer uh, of LINAC4 where you have here the source and the, 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 the low energy uh, part and then the medium energy part to so the MEBIT. Um, now this, we um, had the beam position monitors and the correctors available in all this area here where, um, so after the MEBIT essentially, so in DTL, CCDTL and the PIMS and also the first part here of the transfer line towards then the first synchrotron in the CERN uh, accelerator chain after the LINAC. Um, so this 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 uh, 70 meter, if you want. So this corresponds to 17 BPMs um, and and uh, 16 uh, correctors. Um, and now here, an, an important message also maybe is that even while awake was really proof of principle because they, they don't need any other steering algorithms. They have uh, everything they need. Um, for the Linux, we do not have uh, this, the same kind of control system approach as we do for, have for the synchrotrons and the transfer lines. Um, so they don't work with high level parameters and they do not have, for example, steering algorithms. Um, with NAF, for example, you uh, ha would have an inexpensive way of learning uh, the response, uh, any response actually, it does not have to be linear. Um, and you can solve the control problem. So you can he see here the successful training on uh, the LINAC4 uh, trajectory steering. So this was a bit more stringent and we had uh, many machine protection uh, limitations from all sides that we all had to put into the environment. But eventually we managed to have um, this all uh, fine-tuned and we could actually have um, a training run of, of the agent. Now, uh, an example with TD3. Uh, this is now uh, for the auto matching at the wake. So here the problem is to optimize the spot size at the plasma entrance. 
Um, and um, this is, this is uh, if you want, already much more complicated than uh, trajectory steering. So in order to have um, a state, uh, computer vision was exploited. Um, you can see here uh, 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 what was uh, set up. So as they called it deep fake awake, so it's such that they could even uh, then do this um, offline and prepare all algorithms offline. Um, so they, they trained an autoencoder essentially on uh, the data from the BTV images, um, but not just the autoencoder, much more to it. So they also trained essentially the mapping of this, the, the actors that you would use them, namely the solenoids and, and this, this three quadruples, this triplet, onto um, this beam image, if you want, this autoencoded beam image, and then also uh, um, the mapping onto this the the, the implicit state or the set space uh, state which which they also worked so they either worked with the explicit state so where you'd fit um, the uh, in the, the classical manner the the the, the BTV image uh, or the implicit state which you got from the autoencoder to train their reinforcement learning agents. And there also their objectives, which was, was more complicated. Um, it actually had to minimize the beam size in X and Y um, while uh, keeping the intensity high uh, because of, uh, to, to ensure that you actually don't, don't lose any beam. Um, so they did this, as I said, with the TD3 algorithm and you, you have a similar sort of signature. So uh, uh, episodes, um, uh, here on the x-axis, you have here the absolute length that was long at the beginning and that became shorter and shorter. And you can see here how it did in terms of performance. So at the beginning, um, the, uh, it, it, it couldn't solve the problem, but then after a while, it, it uh, minimized the beam size while keeping the intensity um, uh, um, up. Um, one question that we were asked frequently is um, how often does one have to retrain? Now, as you can you saw earlier, so these trainings, all of those that I showed, took in the order of um, 300 iterations. Now, um, with the um, repetition rates that we had at the various facilities, this was between 30 minutes to 45 minutes, uh, depending a little bit how much averaging one had to do. Now, um, this is... Uh, okay if you do not have to do it too often so ideally you have to train this once for example for a run for a given condition and then you don't train it again until the end of the run um, so obviously this depends very much uh, on, on on the problem how often you will have to retrain so for example if you're talking about trajectory steering we will we would have to retrain this if the lattice is changed uh? so if you're working with a different uh, response matrix if you want. Uh, this would also not be any different if you use the SVD uh, trajectory algorithm. Or if you have hidden state information also. Uh, and this is, this is, for example, one of the issues with the, with the auto, auto matching at awake. Now, we tried to uh, prove that, uh, that uh, if with the trajectory steering algorithm or enough agent, you wouldn't have to retrain again um, by training an agent in June. So this uh, training was done in uh, 10th of June. Um, and then we uh, tested or revalidated without retraining, just revalidated this agent in uh, September on the 22nd. Um, and then there were, and we didn't see any degradation of correction performance. So you can see here, um, we gave it these about 35 different uh, problems to solve, 35 episodes, 35 different initial trajectories, and it had to correct those beyond the threshold, and it did this each time within one or two iterations. Can I uh, also ask a question here? Uh, please go ahead. This is this is extremely uh, interesting, um, and maybe I had a question question before, but this is um, this shows a little more. So my question was presumably for each of those steering elements um, in June there was like a perfect value of each of the steering elements that would um, make you know focus the beam properly. Um, and do you think the network learned those particular value, and then they happened to not change it in September? Or do you think that the network learned something deeper 
and you know the ideal value actually changed in September, but the the network was able to be robust and resilient because it learned something deeper than just the specific value of the steering elements. Does, does the question make sense? Yeah, I I think what I I'll try and interpret it. <laughs> um, so so the, the the networks they don't just learn. Um, I mean, in the, in, in the end, what it, what, it, what it learns is really the response. So if we had uh, uh, reduced the network to just linear, uh, essentially, so no values in there, etc., it would have been just the response matrix. In the end, it is a linear problem, and, 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 and it should just be the response matrix. And the response matrix just depends, um, if you want, from the physics, on on uh, on your focusing at its elements that you have in there. So th these didn't change, yeah? and uh, and because these didn't change, uh, uh, the, the 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 response uh, was also still valid. What did change, however, is the bare trajectory. But it didn't care about the bare trajectory because in any case, uh, um, it always corrects indifference. You see, it knows no matter which trajectory you have, because it has the response kind of learned, it knows what to do with it, how to, to, to use the correct settings to, to minimize this, no matter which uh, bare trajectory you have underneath. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so now I think I haven't uh, spoken about this slide yet. So um, now, can we go, uh, be even more sample efficient? This was then our next question because okay, we have we do have um, uh, 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 machines that uh, do not work at one hertz like a wake uh, does. Okay, it works actually at ten hertz, but we get the acquisitions of one hertz um, or or um, the Linux four, which has a, a, a repetition period of one point two seconds. So, so some of our machines like the SPS, so the larger ones. They have, there you have maybe a, a super cycle length, so a repetition period of a minute, okay? And then 300 uh, iterations becomes already long, okay? And depending on the problem, it might in any way be even more uh, iterations. So how, how can one get the sample efficiency, uh, efficiency uh, further up? So one way, of course, is to go model-based, and we'll have a look at this next. And the other one is, to train on simulation. And we have lots of simulations. Um, and um, so you could try and train your agent actually on simulation and then just use it as uh, a correction algorithm, uh, uh, optimal control if you want uh, on, on the machine and use transfer learning. So we tried that as well. So we also have a gym environment that is just instead of going directly to the machine, which is going to simulation, um, we trained the NAF agent on the simulation and then we tested it or did a validation run on the machine and this is the result. Uh, and okay, similar picture, it's about 40 episodes and it gets all the different initial trajectories and it corrects them each time above the threshold um, and it takes one or two, two iterations. Okay, so model-based. Um, now, model-based reinforcement learning was actually uh, interesting for us or had been interesting for us for a long time uh, because of, of uh, several benefits that you get uh, for free, if you want, at the expense that the, the, the whole uh, uh, algorithm is more complex that, that you're dealing with. Um, so, so what interested is, uh, us was that you actually do learn the model of the dynamics explicitly and you can actually use that as well then for other things afterwards if you want. So you learn the model dynamics explicitly and then you use this uh, learned model dynamics to train the agent instead of going to the machine directly. Um, and, and this, this um, is supposed to reduce the number of interactions that you have to do with the machine. So there are many variants out there um, and we had a look um, at, uh, at the so-called dynastyle model-based uh, reinforcement learning, which is, which is actually really old. It's from, from the 90s and uh, uh, Sutton uh, invented it. And the idea behind it is it's just summarized here in this pseudocode. 
where um, you do two things, or you do interleave two, two things. You interleave essentially the model learning, which is the transition model, if you want, that you learn. So uh, you, if you have uh, state, uh, state S and, and, and action A, uh, uh, you predict the new state and you compare it with, with, with what you predict from your model uh, in MC simply, and you do something similar also for, for, for the reward. So you interleave this model learning with uh, just the normal Q learning, okay? So you train this, this if you want, if you have only two networks, these two uh, networks, um, and you uh, collect your, um, your data sets by, for example, using a random policy. Now we did that in principle, um, slightly differently nevertheless, and I will show you this uh, on one of the next slides. But before I get to this, uh, just a few words about something else that you can do actually. So if you only do, if you do take only one loop, because here, if, you, if I come back to it, you repeat this n times, the data collection, training of the model and training of, the, of your Q network, you repeat this n times, but what if you do that only once? What if you actually uh, run random policy to collect your data set, then you learn this model dynamics from this data set, and then you plan through this model as you would do with model predictive control. Only that behind the model predictive controller uh, is not an analytic model, but a neural net. So this is what we tried, or essentially a student who came to, uh, to us and worked with us for a couple of months from um, the University of uh, Trieste. He's working also on Fermi. Uh, Nikki, I think he's uh, still in the audience also today. So he, he had a look at this and tracked this out and took one of our um, uh, uh, environments, our open AI gym environments, namely the one for uh, uh, awake trajectory correction and uh, tried to use ILQR on the dynamics model that he learned on this environment. Um, as you go through this loop only once, one naively would think that you'd have to have a fairly good model for ILQR actually to work. So what we did initially is that we collected thousand data points um, and uh, then reduced the number of data points out of this data sample more and more for the model building until we, 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 we couldn't reduce any further um, and, uh, and, and let ILQR loosen it. And these are the results. Um, so we had in the end 200 data points that we used to train our, uh, uh, um, uh, the model of our dynamics for essentially, if you want, the response. And then uh, we used ILQR, so this control theory, um, linear quadratic regulator for those that haven't heard about it. Uh, okay, I'm not going to introduce it. It would go a little bit too, uh, too, too far. Um, but um, essentially you can imagine it for those that don't know about it. It is, it, it is essentially, um, uh, it gives you um, a state feedback controller and it corrects as uh, before always um, the trajectories. Here you have 10 episodes um, in, in this particular case in one step each time above the threshold. He also did a longer run uh, um, and here this was 50 episodes uh, with sometimes really, really uh, very bad trajectories. Okay, it sometimes took a little longer, but in principle um, it, it worked um, very well. Now our Dynacode, now coming back to the, the model-based reinforcement learning. So um, we, there are algorithms out there. Um, um, you, you can find them. For example, there is METRPO, uh, the, so the model ensemble uh, TRPO. TRPO is again one of these policy gradient algorithms. But um, frankly, we, we tried those, but I have to admit we couldn't make them work. So what we, we thought is we're going to try our own, um, but we, uh, we, we use the model free agents because in there, as you, can, as you saw earlier, this was Q-learning um, or also with the METRPO, you always have a model free agent. 
um, we use an existing model free agent and we use the one from stable baselines three which is written now in, in, in PyTorch. Uh, we use TD3 there and the models, so the surrogate models that are built within there, so for the, 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 the dynamics, um, this, uh, this we, we, we trained in TensorFlow 2. And that's why essentially why we had to use stable baselines 3 because the original stable baseline just for information is still in TensorFlow 1 and will not be ported to TensorFlow 2. Um, so, but this stable baseline, uh, all these agents, what they need to work, to interact with, are uh, open AI gym environments. So we need to package our surrogate model, if you want, into an open AI gym environment. So we need, to, so we created an, an, a surrogate environment, if you want, that uh, is initialized, of course, with the real environment, because it is also responsible for the data collection. Um, and it provides uh, the model for the dynamics, um, so these neural nets, uh, and it also provides for the training and then later on for the prediction. This is the code um, in pseudocode, if you want. Um, so you have this surrogate environment that is initialized with the real environment. Um, you have uh, this TD3 agent from stable base on three that only learns on the surrogate environment. It does not learn on the real environment. And then you, we filled an initial data buffer with um, uh, um, some samples. This number has to be decided by using random policy. And then we trained our first surrogate model. And then we go in this loop where you interleave between uh, agent learning or training of the agent and then testing the agent on the real environment, see whether it is okay. So you have to write the validation code. If it's okay, you're done. If it's not okay, you use the data that you collected during the validation, you add it to the data buffer uh, that you use then uh, again to uh, train again the model. And then you go in the loop until you're done. Um, so, this is supposed to reduce the number of interactions that you have to do with the machine. So that's why we went for model-based uh, reinforcement learning, just to recall a few numbers. So with NAF, uh, which is hard to beat, um, uh, it took about 300 iterations, but after about 90 iterations, it starts to work okay, okay? Now, if we now look at the model-based uh, reinforcement learning with the, with the Dynac Im implementation, we'll have to look at the length uh, of this data buffer. Um, and uh, already here I tell you that we were working in the end with two real environments, one which was really interacting with, 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 uh, with the machine and the other one actually uh, with the simulation. So this is again for the awake trajectory steering because this is such, an, such a good and easy toy uh, problem. Uh, and I show you here the results actually for the worst run. So we repeated this, this uh, runs uh, several times to get some statistics. Um, and the initial data set contained 50 data points. Huh? So we initially, we always could collect 50 data points. Um, and for this particular run here, it took actually three uh, uh, loop iterations until the agent was good enough on the real environment, okay? Um, and here you can see the training. So the training here of the agent is only done on the surrogate environment. Uh, it always goes to some exploration phase. It, it does not start from scratch, it retrains. So that's why you, you, you see all the, um, actually all the, the iterations of this with the, uh, with the surrogate environment here on one plot. And here you can see the results then through the validations on the real environment. Um, so we always tested in the validation for 10 episodes um, and uh, recorded the final uh, RMS, the final reward, if you want, and also in how many iterations it could achieve this. So our limit was maximum of three iterations. So the first time after the model training, um, this TD3 was not able at all to solve it. Uh, second time round after the model training, it was already much better. It was very close. And then after the third uh, round, it then got it. 
here you can see the statistics of all the, the, the runs that we did. So in the end, we, ran, we did the same thing six times. So the worst one, the one you can saw before was this, this here that took where the, the, the machine data buffer length was 160 iteration or 60 long. So on uh, average or uh, medium essentially was about um, 80. And then, uh, of course, we had to make sure that these um, agents that are tested in this manner also really work. And so we tested one, uh, in, uh, did a validation run, and again, one of these usual plots, yes, um, it works. What was interesting us as well, um, eventually, uh, uh, and, and this is what we, we, we are planning next, really, is that um, if we want to use or if you want to exploit simulation, because we have many simulations, uh, we'll have to come up some, with something that bridges the fact that simulations are not always perfect. There, is, there are differences between the simulations and the machines, and uh, we want to find a way how to, to um, prepare agents on simulations and then only have small retraining to, 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 uh, to uh, learn actually the differences. So this is, uh, there are also papers on this. Some of, the, of them are called residual physics. But as a first sort of trial, what we did, we introduced to all these various environments that we're dealing already with uh, in this uh, model-based RL Dyna style code, we introduced another environment and this another environment would actually only talk to the simulation. So we actually initialized the surrogate environment with the simulated environment and then uh, did the validation on the real environment. So we had to deal with three, three environments. Of course, that worked. Um, we mixed in the data from the machine with uh, this initial data sample that was collected from the simulated environment, which, uh, which is no problem in that particular case because um, the simulation is so close to, to the machine. And of, if you do that, then of course uh, you, you, you reduce um, your uh, number of, of, of interactions with the machine to the bare minimum. So this uh, took actually only one iteration and uh, during the first validation, it already um, made it uh, through and we had a, a sufficiently good uh, controller, which you, can see, which you can see here. So this is, this is all the results are above threshold already during the first validation. So next, so um, what, what we'd like to do, as I said it already, we, we'd like to train a simulation with a small model error, and I want to see how we can actually train these agents to uh, um, uh, find these differences or learn from all of these differences, and then also how long this takes. Obviously, we'd like to take this not, uh, uh, we, we want that this doesn't take very long, otherwise we, we there is no benefit in training on the simulation earlier. Now, there is one, one issue which we haven't actually faced yet, but this might be because our problems are all very well behaved, is what is called in literature model bias. Um, so, because you, you, you want to have as few interactions with, with, with your real environment as possible, or uh, to and, and, and with this very small data set, you, you, you actually learn your, your, your model, your dynamics model. Um, and what this creates very often is this model bias. And there are ways around this using um, probabilistic models, or so Bayesian neural nets or model ensembles. Um, and okay, we would like to see whether we actually have any benefits for this. Maybe not necessarily for the problems that we have right now, but that this, this might nonetheless be important to, to look at. Um, for some of the other things that might might come up, um, we are also just testing actually these days model-based RL on nonlinear problems with the uh, awake matching. Uh, so this looks already very good on deep fake awake. So that works very nicely. Now we have to make it work on the machine. Um, there is obviously uh, the the issue of how to define appropriate states. So uh, this sometimes doesn't come for free. Um, the people working on the weak uh, auto matching have done that already. Now there are other problems out there which which will benefit this uh, from this, where we also uh, uh, um, uh, will have to, to to use computer vision actually to 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 use uh, to get uh, appropriate state information. 
And then, of course, very important is that we um, have ANNs uh, available in the CERN control system. So we're working on storing and retrieving them. So we also made progress on this. Um, and then we would also like to have a generic optimization framework where uh, we have obviously numerical uh, optimizers, but also reinforcement um, learning in, in a toolbox. And this brings me now to the summary. So um, modern accelerators with things, user schedules and physics programs need to be exploited efficiently. Uh, I think everybody knows this. And this needs uh, deterministic uh, operation and automation um, through, for example, automated optimization and uh, machine learning as part of the control room toolkit. Um, now with reinforcement learning, parameter the tune, tuning can be learned by algorithms. Um, and we have shown this also uh, with a few examples um, on real world accelerated tuning problems. These algorithms, they are readily available and they are sample efficient enough uh, for online tuning, I hope I could convince you of that. Um, and with model-based RL and transfer learning, sample efficiency is even less of an issue. There is nevertheless one thing that needs to be available, and this is not always given. Uh, one needs uh, appropriate state information to be even able to formulate um, the problem such that it could be solved by reinforcement learning algorithms. And um, for us, I think the main challenge for reinforcement learning if one has state of, uh, information available, is the implementation of the domain-specific problem uh, in these OpenAI team environments with the reward shaping. That's it. Okay, thank you very much, Reina, for this extensive overview. Um, I will stop the recording now.